Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Summer's back. <laughs> Although the kidders don't believe me. <laughs> they got into my nice cool air conditioned house at 74 degrees and got blankets. <laughs> sweaters. The sweaters. And I thought, you poor people. <laughs> Mike, do you want to stand up and share with us a minute and say hello? Yeah. Next week, Mike and, and Cindy are going to do a presentation on what's been going on and what is going to be happening. Um, but I've asked Mike if you would just stand up and give a shout. Uh, first off, just good morning. Um, it's very good to be home. Um, we're looking forward just to a time of um, refreshment and uh, peace, really, uh, before we get back into the battle. Um, it's very good to see you all, and we thank you all for your prayers. Um, you have no idea, I shared with uh, Kevin when they came down, um, how much prayers, how effective they really are. Um, and they've kept us going over the last few years. Uh, well, God's kept us going through your prayers. Um, like um, Pastor Lynn said, next week we'll give you a full lowdown of what's been going on and where we're going from here. Um, Right now, we just look forward to a time of fellowship with our church family. So, good morning. Good morning. Um, first Sunday of the month, we like to do communion. We like to remember the Lord's sacrifice. So, if I could get um, Matthew and Paul, if you guys could come and help with the communion, please. body broken on our behalf. So we're going to take a minute, just bow our heads, we're going to thank him, and then we're going to take the bread. Father, we thank you that you sent your son to willingly allow his body broken on our behalf, pay the punishment for our sins, and we take this father remembrance of the incredible cost that purchased our, our redemption. Thank you. I don't know if 
whose grandchild that is. <laughs> you must obviously have a very happy grandpa. <laughs> tells us that in the same way he took the cup after the supper and he said this is my blood, the blood of the new covenant. Hebrews tells us that the old covenant wasn't sufficient so a new covenant was made, a better covenant purchased by the blood of the perfect spotless lamb that is Jesus Christ. He says you do this, take this and drink. He says as often as we do this, eat the bread and drink the wine we proclaim the Lord's death. We are telling the world about our Lord's death. So we're going to take a moment and reflect, and then we'll take the wine. Father, we thank you that you paid the price. The price is paid in full. There is no debt left outstanding. There is nothing we can do, Father, to earn your favor in any way. Your son has paid it all. We stand before you righteous because of his broken body and his shed blood. We thank you, Father, and we honor you today in Jesus' name.
So, last week we took the service and we turned it over to the, the group that went down to Belize. Unfortunately, one of said group was not here. He was off doing something. So I've asked Ben Ali if he would be willing to come up and share just a little bit about what's on his heart, what went on in Belize, what God did with him, to him, through him. And then next week, you guys are in a very unique position because next week you're going to get to see the opposite side because you're going to get to see the team that was down there to receive them. Because our group that went down there actually went to the Kidders and worked with the Kidders in the village that the Kidders have been ministering in for two plus years. So, Ben, if you would go ahead and come up. <coughs> Well, Glenn graciously gave me an hour and no, two hours and 15 minutes to prepare for this, so. Maybe <laughs> hey, about a week and a half. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, All right, so, Belize. Well, I didn't know if I was going to be able to go to Belize the week before we actually left because I didn't have my passport yet and I was expecting to be shipping out for basic training, you know, but the Army ended up sending my paperwork to D.C. to get reviewed by the review board, so my whole life was kind of in a, a no thing, so the week before I just asked the third of the passport, you hear God still want me to go, and miraculously it came 24 hours later, so we <laughs> go. And well, going down there, yeah, I really didn't have any idea what to expect, just because I thought I was going to be going to the military pretty soon, and I thought that might job with the youth group was probably wrapping up and I was moving on to something else. So um, I was just kind of, didn't know what to expect and when we got down there Mike really encouraged us and just said something that kind of clicked. He's like, this is a war zone really and you guys got to just focus on God and you can't focus on anything else otherwise you'll be really infected. So I took that to heart and I just did my best to focus on God and just not worry about what was going on at home and that really helped a lot so thank you. And um, I was just focus fully on what God wanted me to do and basically we just did a lot of work and I just worked my tail off as best as I could and so that was something that I guess shocked me because I'm not a real big acts of service person, I rather talk to people. I kind of just, I don't know, it's kind of like, ah, oh, I don't want to do this, but I forced myself through and God gave me the ability to do it and it was really awesome to just feel able to work diligently for him and, and just a lot of amazing things happened and it was really cool to see other believers down there just you know, go through the same stuff we do. It's just you know different country, and I really blessed me to meet Pastor Kenny and you know other guys like Robert and Benji, and just you know they go through the same struggles we do. You know they're in a different you know world country. It's just the same thing. They just you know just need to rely on God and just you know, just keep praying for the guys of that church like Benji and Robert. They just need to they just need to be encouraged and stuff up, and they've really been really heavy on my heart. And, um, Mike was just a very big encouragement to me, just everything he was doing, and just really encouraged me to, you know, do whatever I was, just to do what I was supposed to be down there, and just gave me a fire for God to just focus 24-7 on Jesus, and that example really helped me to do the same thing down there, and since I've been back, and on the way, it was hard to leave, I really wanted to stay, honestly, I wanted to be down there for a long time, because I loved it, it was, it was very hard to leave for me, because it's fairly close to God, and I felt like, you know, I, I haven't been closer to God, I think, in my life, and I was just like, wow, I want to keep doing this. And anyway, leaving, that was hard, but um, on the plane right home, I just kind of surrendered to God, you know, Colossians 4, 17, take heed to the ministry which you received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. I didn't know what it was coming back. I didn't know if this was my last year with the youth group, and if I was moving on to the military or not, God, I was pretty much surrendering to God. I will do whatever you need to do wholeheartedly. And I got a call Tuesday from my recruiter saying, one more doctor has to okay paperwork. And then Wednesday night, I got another call and they said I wasn't fit. So and they confirmed it Thursday because they're going to try to do something else, like a non combatant job. I didn't get that either. So God wants me at this youth group and I'm going to fill it. I'm very excited to see what he does. Mm -hmm. so that's really mm -hmm. just mm -hmm.
request that was given last week, uh, Kevin actually asked that we would continue to pray for the, the group that went down there because, you know, we don't want to have a church camp mentality. You know, where you go and you spend five or seven days at a church camp, you come back and you're pumped because you've been getting pumped into all week and everything's about God and the music's exciting and the message is exciting and everybody around you is exciting and you come home and all the people that are at home didn't go to camp with you and they're not exciting. They're not excited. <laughs> and, and so that excitement lasts briefly and then fades and we settle back into the doldrums. We need fire to keep expanding. You know, when the kids come back, and I, they're all kids, even, even Kevin, I call him a kid. Um, <laughs> and they're on fire. We need to be dry tinder, not damp wood. Okay. We need to look with excitement at the things that God did, not with judgment going, oh, that probably wasn't God. That was probably some of that weird Belizean food. <laughs> okay. That was Ricardo. That was Ricardo. My prayer is that we catch the fire that they got a glimpse of down there, that they bring it back and it ignites us. That we shake off the complacency of a humdrum everyday life where we settle into a routine and we have our expectations of what God does and doesn't do and we set the parameters in which we will allow Him to operate. We set the parameters in which we will operate and tell God this much and no more. My prayer is we burst through those and we become like God intended in whatever way He intended. I believe there are more missionaries in this body waiting to go out. I believe some of you have already heard a call to be a missionary and go out. But the concerns of this life, you kind of tuck it away to the side and push it down. I believe some of you have been called to do other things locally. I believe some of you have been called to do things in this church that you've been resisting. Oh, I'm not qualified for that. If we're dependent on you, you're right. You're not qualified. I'm not qualified to be standing up here. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. Okay? He gives you what you need when you need it. I don't need water skis. There's no water here. But we get down to Lake Como and I need a floaty and water skis. Okay? I don't need them here. But if God has called me to Lake Como, you think He's going to provide what I need here right now? No, no. He's going to wait till I get there. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Flip open with me if you would, please. I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians. That would be a very different message. back to the basics. We're taking a, a little hiatus from the essentials. Uh, this is a message that I feel like God has put on my heart for a couple of weeks now. Um, we're going to come back to the basics. 1 Corinthians 5, I'm going to start in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let's ponder that for just a minute. If you are in Christ Jesus, you're a new creation. You're brand new. The old is gone. Now, Unfortunately, a lot of us come to Christ and we bring a portfolio. 
and it's full of pictures of the old person we used to be. And we want to decorate our new life in Christ with pictures of the old life. Sometimes glorying and reveling in them, sometimes to our shame. I remember when I did that, oh man. Yeah, I remember that. Oh, that was great. That was sin. Oh. Well, what about this one? Remember these days? Yeah, that was sin. Because <clears throat> see, that was all our old life was, was sin. Not that you couldn't have done good things, but apart from Christ, there is no good thing. So, dirt, 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 dirt. <clears throat> We're a new creation. The old has passed away. Let it be dead and buried. Okay? Quit going out and visiting your old self's grave. Let it be gone. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We're going to come back to this in just a minute. Keep your finger there in verse 17 because we're going to come back to this. I'm sorry, 18. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Okay, now there's two things I want to address here. Now the first thing is this new creation. What is this new creation? You see, Paul kind of, Paul speaks parenthetically a lot. He says, this is what I'm talking about. Wait a minute, let me cover this. Oh yeah, we're getting back to this. Okay? And sometimes it, it seems a little bit disjointed. But Paul covers a lot of ground. So we have a new creation. All this is from God. Who makes us a new creation? Oh, come on. Who makes the new creation? God. All right. Do you have anything to do with being made a new creation? No, God does it. If you could do something, there would be no need for the cross. So Jesus died in vain. Okay? So, we have, all of this is from God, the new creation, that's from Him. We'll jump down here to verse 21. He says, for our sake, that, that, that's us, He made Him, okay, so first let's, let's identify who is He and who is Him. He is God, okay, we back up to the verse before, and we see he being referred to as God. That's who he's still addressing. Made him, who's him? Jesus. Jesus Christ. To be sin. Who knew no sin. Okay? Do you understand what that means? Everything that you have ever done, are currently doing, or ever will do, was addressed here. Right there on the cross. Okay? Everything that you could ever do was addressed on the cross. You could do nothing to get it addressed. Therefore, God sent His Son, who was perfect, who lived a perfect life, who is subject to every temptation that you and I are subject to, and yet did not sin. Now think about that for a minute. Because sin isn't what you do, it's what you harbor in your heart. So it's not even committing an act. Sometimes it's thinking a thought. And he didn't even blow that. Because there's a lot of times that I don't do an act in my flesh but boy, is it going on in my head. <laughs> Driving down the road and that tractor pulls right out in front of me doing two and a half miles an hour. Mm. And he's just wide enough I can't get around him. Now, I may not do anything in my flesh, but there's a lot going on in here. Jesus didn't even do that. 
Okay? So he was perfect. He who knew no sin. God made sin. God took all of the sin from us and laid it to his account. Okay? Now, for those of you that are going, wow, you know, this, this sounds a lot like predestination. It's not predestination. Don't, don't, don't get tripped up here because we, we back up a verse and you're going to see something that I think argues against predestination. He says in verse, um, verse 20, he says, We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Okay? That means you have to do something. You have to allow what God has done to take place in your life. Look, as far as predestination goes, here's my stance on predestination. Without God, we're lost. With God, we have a chance. We have a choice. We can't do anything but say yes. Okay? It says, if we confess our sins. It doesn't say if God confesses your sin through you. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Okay? So, the part that we play, tiny. The part that he plays, as infinite as the universe. So, to even compare them, you know, these people that are free will, oh, like, you, you've got something that you can do to impress God. No, I have an obedience to the thing that he's called me to. There's nothing I can do to impress God. Please. Really? My little Lego set's going to impress somebody that made the universe? Come on. So, God took care of it all through His Son. His Son bore the price. But there's another point here that I want to make. So first, we have salvation. Free. No cost to us. All we have to do is accept it. The gift isn't yours unless you take it. I could walk up with a precious gift and hand it to you, and until you take it, it's not yours. You don't receive it. You make no use of it. You don't even know what's in it. All you know is there's a gift. So we have salvation. But there's something else in here that I want to draw your attention to. Let's jump back up to verse 18. He says... All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now hold on to that thought, because we're going to tie this together here for a second. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Do you see what's going on here? God has given you a precious gift and He's asking you, He's actually entrusted you, He's actually requiring of you the sharing of that gift. You see that? He gave us the ministry of reconciliation and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So, this that was given to us, He is now requiring that we share with others. Now, I'm going to make this very simple. Um, let's flip over to Mark chapter 4. You guys have heard me quote this parable before. But I want you to understand what it is, how this ties together, what this looks like. I'm going to start in verse 1. I'm going to read for a while, and then we'll, we'll talk about this. So Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Listen! you got to wonder why he said listen. 
you, you people talking and, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people, a lot of things going on. I think he's getting their attention. When the Bible says, listen, pay attention, because something important is coming. Okay? So he says, listen! Exclamation point. So it's more like this. Listen! Okay? Behold, a sower went out to sow. Now, okay, I know a lot of you guys in here aren't farmers. I am not a farmer. I'm not a gardener. I'm a lawner. <laughs> the grass grows, I mow it. The grass dries up, I water it. That's it. Okay? The sower is the one that goes out and plants the seeds. All right? A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depths of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now this, this, this gives me hope right here, okay? And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see but never perceive, and may indeed hear but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? See, this gives me hope. Because if the disciples who had been with him for a while are waiting until they get him alone and go, I didn't get it. That gives me hope that I might someday get it. And it should give you hope that someday you might get it. Now, this one's pretty easy because Jesus explains it so we get it all at one shot. But we don't know how long it was from sitting on the boat to when they were alone. And the disciples were sitting there, John, we're fishermen, dude. What's this sewing stuff? Can't he use fishing metaphors? <laughs> I mean, you know, casting bait or casting nets. Come on, why has he got to use some sewing stuff? So this gives me hope that there will be understanding. So in verse 14, we're going to pick up again. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who, when they, receive, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. Now, I'm, I'm going to follow through for just a second. Keep up with me. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So, we just talked about being ministers of reconciliation. Now, what, what does reconciliation mean? Can somebody give us a working definition of reconciliation? Get back together? Yeah, it's to be restored to right relationship. Okay? Um, you have a fight with your spouse. You blew it. You messed up. You got angry. You got off. Now, she is the offended party. 
Uh, that, okay, because I know a lot of you guys don't do this, I'll just hit it. It's me and Christy. Okay, okay that, way, that way nobody's like, see, I told you he knows everything. <laughs> okay, I don't want any husbands coming up to me afterwards and saying, she talked to you, didn't she? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, we'll just use me and Christy in a purely hypothetical situation. Okay? I did something stupid. I offended Christy. She's mad at me. Now, in order for there to be reconciliation, what's my responsibility? I need to go and, and confess and repent. Okay? I have to confess. I, I blew it. I made a mistake. I messed up. And I have to repent. I have to not do that anymore. Because if I go and confess and say, yeah, I blew it, I messed up. But you still did this and it really messed up everything I was planning. That's not it. Okay? Because see, there has to be confession as to what you did wrong. And then there has to be repentance turning away from it. Because otherwise all the confession is, is just a new entry to an old argument. Okay? So I go, I confess, I repent, and then she... Yes. For gifts. Yes, thank you. And now, on her part, once she forgives, it's done. She, it, see, as it's not my place to rehash the whole thing to confess and, you know, kind of give her gigs as I'm doing my part. Neither is it her thing to forgive and rehash it to give me gigs. It's done. It's over. Now here's the thing about this. Who was the offended party in this? Christy was. I'm the one that, that attacked her. I'm the one that did something wrong. But, but the ministry of reconciliation that we have is reverse. See? Because we sinned, we affronted God, we broke the righteous requirement that He had, we did this, and yet He put in place the means for us to be reconciled to Him. That wasn't his place. That was our place. We're the ones that messed up. So we have to do something to, to restore the relationship. Unfortunately, we can't because he's holy. Remember our definition for holy? He is perfect. He is set apart. He is not profane. He's not common. He's unique. When we became profane, when we became sinners, we were completely separate from him. And we had no ability to restore ourselves, reconcile that relationship. So God made a way. He made a way through His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the ministry of reconciliation. We sinned. We offended God. We affronted Him. We spit in His face. We tore the beard from His face. We scourged Him. We beat Him. We whipped Him. We nailed Him to a cross. All of that was, that was my fault. That was your fault. <laughs> Yeah, that wasn't the Roman soldiers. That wasn't the Jewish guards. That wasn't the, the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. That was us. It was them too, but for not the reason you're thinking. Why? Jesus went to that willingly. Willingly. And so, the blood was shed, the perfect atoning blood that gives us righteousness, right standing before God. We can now come into the very presence of God and not be stricken dead. Because we're cool? No, because we're covered in the blood of the Lamb. Okay? So, reconciliation. The relationship has been made right. Okay? And with God, you know... I don't know how the rest of you married people, how your forgiveness works. Mine works spasmodically. Okay? Yeah, sweetie, I forgive you until the next time she does it. And then I go back and I list off each time that she did it previously and add that to the stack. And I'm learning true love keeps no record of wrongs. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> But I'm learning. God, who does have true love, <coughs> agape, unconditional, keeps no record of wrongs. When you come in forgiveness, it is wiped away 
as far as the east is from the west, that's how far it's been removed from you. Okay? That's reconciliation. The relationship is restored. Okay? Now, that's not the end of it. Because then he entrusts us. You get that word, entrusts? That means that God is placing trust in you. He entrusts to us the ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? Well, it means we have responsibility, doesn't it? Doesn't it? I mean, he has reconciled us to him, and then he has given to us the ministry of reconciliation, entrusted to us the message of reconciliation, so what do we have to do? Well, you're not doing it now. You have to talk. You have to verbalize or communicate in some other means this message of reconciliation. You could text. Not right now. Put the phones away. You could write a letter. But I find talking is, is the most efficient. The most efficient. You can, you can read all kinds of tones into the written word. Now you can you can read all kinds of inflections and temper and yeah oh he said that just to get me okay but if you're talking to them it's much harder to do that because they can see the body language they can hear the tone of voice they can hear the inflection okay so if God has trusted to us the message of reconciliation what do we have to do sure yeah we we got to get out and share it we got to get out and tell people about it. And, and, and not just people that already have it. See, that's, that's the problem with most Christians. Is we'll talk to each other about reconciliation. Oh man, yeah. You know, God forgave me of this and this and that and the other thing. And my life has been made new. And I have joy and I have peace. But then you get out to somebody that's not a Christian. And you're like, what's up? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, America, World Cup, yeah. Great goalie, bad game. Fireworks are great. Hot dogs. Good talk. <laughs> Why is that? Why? Why? What what are we afraid of? Rejection? Well, well, here's your choice. If you confess me before man, I will confess you before the Father. But if you deny me before man, surely I will deny you before the Father. Now, there is always two means to do something, by omission or by commission. Commission means you, Jesus, you know, say, oh, hey, are you a Christian? No, I thought, I thought I saw you come to church. I was working on the plumbing. <laughs> on Sunday, it was an emergency. That's commission. You lie. You deny him verbally. There's also omission. You just don't tell. You just keep your mouth shut. You never speak into them a message of reconciliation. You never let the light that is in you shine forth. You bucket it. And we come to church and a little, let it peek out a little bit. Oh, no, that's a good song, a little bit more. I believe. You know? And then it's amazing. You, you pay attention when you're out in public. It's absolutely amazing. Blows my mind. You'll be standing there, and you watch somebody that's a, a, che a checker. I'm going to use Christy's story. Checker at a uh, supermarket. Got this button on that she loves the Lord, and, and evidently she knew the person that was in line in front of Christy. And, and they go to the same church, and they're just going on and on about how fantastic service was. Wasn't the message great? The worship was, I was just in tears. God was moving. He was powerful. He was wonderful. It was awesome. See you next week. May I help you? <laughs> That'll be fourteen ninety-six. Thank you for shopping at Snyder's. <laughs> Boy, did that get bucketed quick. <clears throat> she had no clue that Christy was a Christian. She had no clue that Christy had just come from church. 
Not her church. I don't even maybe it was her church. I don't know. I didn't see her. But, but isn't that amazing? Who really needed the light? Who needed the light? Man, if I'm walking around with my, you know, nine light LED that Nick got me that'll blind you. I love that light. It's got a little expander thing so it'll get bigger and smaller and I stand out in the backyard. It's fantastic. I love that light. And then I got my great big old flashlight I turn on and you can't hardly even see it. Okay. Who needs the light? Those that are in the dark. Who has the light? Do we? Then shouldn't we show the light? Isn't it our responsibility to show the light? What have we to be ashamed of? What? That by the world's measure, we don't measure up? Okay, really. God's measure, the world's measure. Who are you trying to please? What does Paul say? I'm not trying to please man. I'm trying to please God. He's the only one I want happy with me at the end of the day. If at the end of the day, I have offended 15 people because of the gospel, and I lay in bed at night, and I'm frustrated because nothing went right that day, who do you think is happy with me? Do you think I ended a successful day? Yup. Yup. We have got to get out of the pews, get out of the chairs, and get into the world. We have got to be firmly convinced of our salvation. I mean, look at this. Do you really believe that God reached down into the pit of hell that you were headed in, that you were mired in, and saved you for eternity? Do you really believe that He took you out of all the garbage that was your life and saved you and cleaned you up and dressed you in robes of white linen? Do you really believe he has delivered you from all sin? Why would you deny anyone that? Why would you not even give them the opportunity to say yes or no? Because they might say no, they might say yes. This one time might be the time they say yes. Ezekiel talks about the watchman. Remember that? God called him to be a watchman. And he gave him this condition. He said, look, if people come up to attack the city and the watchman speaks forth a warning and the people do not get up and they are slaughtered. Their blood is on their own head. But if the watchman does not give warning, the blood of the people is on his head. you understand that? We have a responsibility to share the gospel. I mean, the gospel. What, is, what does gospel mean? Good news. Good news. Do you believe it's good news? Do you really believe it's good news? Yes. Or is it just kind of okay news? Great. Yes. Isn't it? I mean, I look at where he took me out of, and I look at the things he's changing in me even today. And I look at people around me that are lost, that are dying, that are so, so enmeshed in their sin that they can't even... I, 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 sometimes I wonder how they even function. People who have family members that are dying and they have no hope. They have no hope. How do you deal with life without hope? We have a hope. We have a hope not just in this life, but for eternity. Because at the end of things in this life, that's when things get good. 
you understand that? Yeah, God, God can make things good in this life. To be honest with you, sometimes I think the things we think are good are not from God. I think they're a distraction. But as good as this life is, it's garbage compared to what comes next. I'm not talking about streets of gold and foundations of precious jewels. I'm talking about being in the eternal light of our Heavenly Father where there will be no darkness, where we can come face to face with the Almighty and be reconciled. That reconciliation is complete and we have fellowship. Okay? I mean, have you ever been to somebody's house that had a really nice house but they were a jerk? <laughs> Who wants to stay there? You ever been to a house that's not so nice but the fellowship is awesome? It's not the surroundings that make it important. It's who's there that makes it important. Okay? I would encourage you. Look, don't use the excuse. I'm not an evangelist. No. You are saved by grace. You are pure before God because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You are one of His, and He has given you a responsibility. He's entrusted you. He trusts you with a task to share the message of reconciliation. And open your eyes. Man, there's, there's opportunities all around you. All around you. But you have to have your mind there. Your mind has to exist in that state of oneness with God. You've got to be with God. Okay? You've got to be built up in Him. You've got to know His Word. You've got to know His person. That's how Paul can say it. Pray without ceasing. Because your mind is always aware of God. I I'm going to challenge you. I'm laying down a challenge right now. <clears throat> This week, I'm asking for 15 minutes every day. 15 minutes where you get alone with God, close your Bible, turn off your radio, close your mouth, and be quiet before God. Just be still and know He is God. That's a discipline we fail at miserably. I'm, I'm horrible. I have like ADHD in my brain. Because my, my brain races, 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 races. I make a point every day to sit and be still. And let God do as He will. Sometimes He'll give me a scripture. Wait till the 15 minutes is over. That scripture will be there. If it's from God, it'll still be there. Don't worry. Sometimes He gives me a song. Sometimes... I have a, a particular spot I sit. Sometimes when I'm sitting there with my eyes closed, I could swear that God comes and sits right next to me. And doesn't say a word, just sits next to me, enjoys the day, enjoys time with me. And I don't dare open my eyes because I don't want him to leave. So I'm asking you, I'm challenging you, 15 minutes. Every day. Get alone by yourself. If you have to get up earlier, get up 15 minutes earlier. Find a quiet place. Find a peaceful place. John and Charles Wesley's mother had 13 children. They lived in a very small house. And she would, every day, when she spent her time with the Lord, she would sit in her locker and she would take her apron and she would put it over her head. And the kids would know, when the apron is over Mama's head, leave her alone. She's with God. Leave her alone. And as long as that apron was over her head, she was left alone. And she had her time with God. Okay? I don't think any of us are in that situation. But take 15 minutes. I need another put, put five, five up here, Ken. <laughs> 15 minutes. 
I wasn't going to take my shoe off. Okay? 15 minutes every day. I would encourage you to do it at the start of your day. But if, if that doesn't work, make it regular. Make it consistent. Every day this week, 15 minutes. Get along with God. Be still. Learn to be still before God. Okay? See what he would do. Okay? Why do you think they call us disciples? Hmm? Why do you think the word is the same root as discipline? Why do you think he tells us, control your thoughts? Set your mind on things above. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, there's a lot that he expects of us, but the really cool part about it is he has sealed us with his Holy Spirit. He has filled us with his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit enables us to accomplish everything that he's asked of us. Okay? All right. Now, do I dare put you all on the spot and see who's going to take up the challenge? I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Because ultimately, if you're doing it to impress me, that doesn't work. I want this to be something between you and God. Okay? Amen? Father, we bless you today. We thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, for your salvation. Father, for reconciliation. Father, that you made a way for us to be restored to you. Father, even in the midst of grievous, hurtful, disgusting offense, you made a way, Father, that we could be restored to you. Father, I thank you for that shed blood and that broken body, for that cross, Father. Your son took my place, paid my price, and that, Father, with freedom I can come before you, knowing that I am righteous because of him. I ask, Lord God, that you would continue to grow in us, in each of us at Jesus Community Church, Father, your spirit, your drive, your passion, your love, your zeal. Father, that you would open our eyes that we would see the world around us as you see it. Father, that our hearts would be broken as yours is broken for the hurt that is around us. Father, that we would be busy to do those things that you have called us to do. That we would be faithful in the commission that you've given us. Lord God, that we would be bold and courageous Mighty warriors, Father. You have armored us. You have given us full suits of armor for battle. And you said that the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. Father, you have not called us to be cowards. You have not called us to be complacent. You have not called us to be retiring. You have called us to advance. To move forward. You have told us that we are in a battle. Father, that our enemy is not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and wickedness and high places. Father, our enemy is the devil and everything that he stands for. <clears throat> Help us, Father, to have your eyes, your ears, and your heart. Help us to have courage to do what you've called us to do. We bless you. We thank you. We pray these things knowing, Father, that they are in accord with your word. In Jesus' name we pray.